on this edition of Expose. Reporters learn of a little-known federal program with a colossal budget of two and a quarter billion dollars. Something that most people didn't even know existed. Members of Congress don't know this exists. But is anyone minding the store? Funding for Expose has been provided by In the fall of 2004, after filing a report on excessive executive pay at a Portland charity, the Oregonian's Washington reporter Jeff Kossip began researching the biggest story of his young career, what would become a 10-month investigation into an obscure federal agency that doled out contracts to charities. It was known by an odd-sounding acronym, JWAD. This is something that most people didn't even know existed. Members of Congress don't know this exists. JWAD stands for the Javits-Wagner O'Day Program. The JWAD program directs federal money to charities that provide jobs to people who are blind or severely disabled. To qualify for the set-aside contracts, at least 75% of a contractor's labor must be performed by people meeting these criteria. Housed in this unmarked office building outside Washington, JWAD is run by a special committee appointed by the president. With just 29 employees, it is one of the government's smallest independent agencies. They're just not used to much public scrutiny. We're kind of in the middle of nowhere and not that far from the Pentagon, so this isn't exactly a very high profile agency. Not high profile, but intriguing. When it began in the early 1970s, JWAD was just a $200,000 a year program. By 2005, its contracts were worth two and a quarter billion dollars annually. This program has skyrocketed in terms of the size, the scope, and they really stayed under the radar until recently, until we started writing about it. I got a basic briefing of what this investigation was about, and you know, I had never heard of a JWAD. It sounded like something you scraped off your shoe after going for a walk. Jeff came out to, to Portland and we spent an entire day going through the highlights. I, I was getting all the terminology wrong. There's a bazillion acronyms, JWAD, NISH, NIV, and so I had to kind of learn as I went. The reporters sensed something big. They learned that not only had JWAD's payouts ballooned, but unlike most federal programs, it was receiving little congressional oversight. Hey. The paper assigned veteran investigative reporters Les Zeitz and Brian Denson to join Kossif on the story. Photographer Faith Cathcart filled out the team. I just felt like this was a terribly important story and I wanted to do it right. Over a 10-month investigation on an unlikely journey from Portland to Washington, D.C., to El Paso, Texas. The reporting team would learn just how much can go wrong in a well-intentioned federal program. Jeff Kossif began the investigation with a list of JWAD's largest contractors. The charities that had received the most federal dollars to provide jobs for people with severe disabilities. At the top, was a charity called the National Center for the Employment of the Disabled, NCED. Never heard of it before, it said it's based in El Paso, Texas, and they had $150 million in sales. That was more than twice as much as the second largest producer. What are they doing down in El Paso? Are they employing every person with a disability in South Texas? How are they earning all of this money? His interest peaked. Kossif next took a look at NCED's tax returns. The CEO and president, Bob Jones, is reported as receiving no compensation, no benefits. And toward the end, there are a bunch of footnotes. The footnotes didn't show anything that was necessarily illegal, but they caught the reporter's eyes nonetheless. You had the charity investing in a Learjet charter business 
that was partly owned by the president of the charity. And you had the charity investing in a privately owned hospital that the president of the company had a financial interest in. But it was the last footnote which made them want to dig deeper. The most interesting thing about the footnotes was one that said the center pays JFT management fees and commissions based on revenues and increases in net assets for management and consulting services. JFT management received more than $4.5 million in 2003. The trick was finding out what was JFT management and what was JFT. And that is what took a little bit of, of work uh, on everybody's part. To learn more about the mysterious JFT management, Jeff Kossif and Faith Cathcart flew to El Paso to visit the charity making the payments to it, NCED. There, they met NCED's chief executive, Bob Jones. He's just larger than life. He's very tall, I'd say 6'4", six 6'5". Six you would picture him as the quintessential Texas businessman. Immediately, there's a sense that Bob is well-connected, Bob is liked, Bob has friends in high places. So there is a confidence that comes along with that, and perhaps a certain, you know, could be read arrogance. You need to understand, I am a, a hardcore business person, not a born-again do-gooder, any of those kinds of things. And an awful lot of the JWAT industry is managed <clears throat> by individuals that come from caregiving more than business background. Mine was completely business. El Paso needed business because El Paso needed jobs. Its once flourishing garment industry had moved offshore, leaving thousands of skilled garment workers unemployed. Because our textile community was being devastated by globalization, it was the intriguing opportunity of using a not-for-profit in JWAD to deal with the dilemmas of manufacturing in America that made my mind go active on how we might make a success of this business. Seeing a golden opportunity, Jones obtained JWAD contracts to make chemical warfare suits. As demand spiked following the U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, Jones built NCED into a JWAD juggernaut. It was been a magical trip. By 2005, NCED had become the nation's top maker of chemical warfare suits, with 4,000 workers churning out 90,000 a month. To comply with the law, NCED certified in written filings to the government that more than three-quarters of the work was done by people with severe disabilities. Faith and I went for a tour of all of the plans, and one of the first things that I noticed that I didn't think much of until I'd been to a lot of the plans was these people are incredibly productive. It was a machine, and it was just uh, building upon building and camp upon camp set up to you know, make different uniforms and chem suits. Most of the employees speak Spanish as a first language. And fortunately, Faith speaks Spanish fluently. And toward the end, we would always ask, you know, do you have a disability, a physical, emotional, mental? And I kind of gave them a variety of options, check the box. And um, most people's, no, no, not most, everyone that I spoke with would look at me with this kind of glazed over blank stare and like, um, are you kidding? I'm disabled. <laughs> there was approximately anywhere from 30 to 40 disabled parking spaces for somebody that was employing 4,000 people. Mike Amada is a former NCED executive and was a key background source for the Oregonian. He has not gone public until now. They want to verify the um, home address of Bob Jones. In so addition to sharing inside information with the reporters, Amada also served as a guide, showing them various properties owned by Bob Jones, including his home. He showed us a gated neighborhood, and we were able to look up the hill and, and see that these you know, enormous houses on, on a dusty, dry El Paso hillside. Uh, we got to the guardhouse, and um, they turned us away. And that required Faith at one point to actually fly up uh, over the place and shoot photographs. All of the homes in that gated community are very exclusive. 
but his had this aura of being kind of the castle <laughs> at the top of the road that just kind of took the cake. Bob Jones made no salary running NCED, yet he had the home of a wealthy man. The reason lay in that mysterious consulting firm buried in the footnotes of the charity NCED's tax return, JFT Management. The initials JFT, it turned out, stood for Jones Family Trust, as in Bob Jones. Robert Jones had set up a separate company that he owned called JFT Management. And rather than paying himself a salary, he had the charity pay management fees to his company. All right. Jones's management company was paid a percentage of annual NCED revenues, plus a bonus for increases in the charity's net assets. For Bob Jones, that meant the larger the JWAD contracts, the fatter the payday. This is capitalism, even when it's not for profit. And when you start to disincentive uh, people to do what it is they're doing, it's just not the American way. Back at the Oregonian, Brian Denson began the tedious job of examining the finances of all the top JWAD contractors. We spent <laughs> months typing in all of the financial data of all of these nonprofits. Uh, it was thousands and thousands of pages. The one big kahuna finding clearly was the uh, salaries of the uh, chief executives. The top knockers in all of these nonprofits climbed 57%, you know, over a three, four year period uh, from 2000 to 2004. Some of them were making three, four, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars. And of course, in the case of uh, Bob Jones in El Paso, um, you know, four million, four and a half million dollars. And back in El Paso, a critical source came forward with inside information on NCED. A person so afraid to cross Bob Jones that he wouldn't allow Jeff Kossif to reveal his identity. I won't say who the source is or how the source was related to NCED, but among the reporters and editors, we early on developed a nickname for the source as Sahara Sarah. We met him at a Mexican restaurant, uh, sort of a small family cafe type place. Sahara was, you know, clearly nervous to be talking with us. Sahara told the reporters he had a treasure trove of documents, including copies of checks that Jones had written from his charity, NCED, to his consulting firm, JFT Management. I mean, essentially what he was doing is just using NCED as his personal piggy bank. This was pay dirt if Sahara was telling the truth. In order to run with the story, the reporters themselves would have to get their hands on the documents. After several meetings, always in out of the way places, Sahara finally directed Zeitz to an El Paso law firm where the documents were stashed. A legal aid takes me to this, this you know, 10 by 10 room with a small round table in it. And here's these two notebooks, and, and I mean, it didn't take me 10 minutes to, to determine that we had struck a significant find here because there were copies of canceled checks, there were uh, a, essential internal accounting records. And so I found the law clerk, I said, I really need to make copies of this. I said, well, we really don't have a very good copy for that. I said, well, what if I take this to a Kinko's? Well, that, that'd be fine. Well, that. I was just throwing out an idea. I really didn't expect a law firm to let me anywhere out of the building with these, this pile of documents, but the law clerk said, fine, and gave me instructions to the nearest Kinko's. And I, I am just copying like mad, but the stuff is stapled, it's stapled sideways, there's long stuff. I mean, the copy machine jams up, uh, you know, papers are flying out of the floor. I'm, I'm knocking stuff because I'm just, I want to get this, I want my copies and I want to safeguard them myself. So anyway, I get through the logistics and, and get the notebooks back and thank the law clerk, and that was the last set of it. And then I went back to the motel room that night and just kept shaking my head. I said, this is it. We're on, we're, 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 on, we're on our way. Among the documents, one stood out as a smoking gun. The most important document that we had was a handwritten note that's just one page from the chief operating officer 
Ernie Lopez to Bob Jones saying, Bob, these are the numbers I was telling you about. What this memo showed is that, that the top executives of the charity and Bob Jones uh, were well aware that their labor pool was not, did not meet the federal requirements. But they had been filing annual reports with the federal government where they swore that they had been complying with the law. The Ernie Lopez memo described two categories of workers at NCED. The first column shows the percentage with disabilities. This never exceeds 44 percent, falling far short of the 75 percent legal requirement. Internal NCED records would later reveal that even this figure was wildly exaggerated. Alongside, Lopez had detailed a second category of workers he listed as disadvantaged. A separate company document showed that the disadvantage was an inability to speak English. Well, this is El Paso. This is right across the, the border from Juarez, Mexico. You know, a million and a half Spanish-speaking residents. It, it, it would be no disadvantage in El Paso that you spoke only Spanish. I mean, it's almost a disadvantage in El Paso if all you speak is English. And the important thing to note is the Javits Wagner a Day program, specifically in the statute, is only for people who are blind or severely disabled. There's nothing about disadvantage. There's nothing even about disabled. It's severely disabled. The reporters did not stop with Sahara's documents. Hunting through public records, Zeitz discovered that Bob Jones had relocated to El Paso from Houston. He found it a curious move. El Paso is not exactly the garden spot of Texas. Houston is a major metropolitan urban cosmopolitan city, and I'm trying to think about why would this guy go from one place to the other. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Houston, where the local town is approximately We found a lawsuit in the federal courthouse in Houston where the U.S. Department of Labor accused Jones of illegally tapping into a federally protected profit-sharing plans for the employees of a company that he had operated in Houston. Bob Jones left Houston as a bankrupt, almost run out of town businessman. And here he is, you know, 12, 15 years later, uh, he's worth himself personally and through his uh, family trust millions and millions of dollars. There was only one source for those millions and millions of dollars, and that was the charity in Texas. The Oregonian asked for a second interview, but got nowhere. I kept uh, seeking interviews with Bob Jones, uh, leaving phone messages, sending emails, sending faxes, and finally I sent Jones a very detailed list of questions that addressed uh, uh, most of my findings. My approach to this is, if I'm going to write about somebody, I want them to know everything I know about them so they can correct it and explain it. And we were asking pretty direct questions, uh, and we never got responses. When Zeitz asked NCED to explain that document showing how few of its employees had severe disabilities, the Ernie Lopez memo, the NCED lawyers demanded it back, saying it was company property. For the Oregonian, that amounted to the confirmation they needed that the Ernie Lopez memo was authentic. Unless you have Lopez telling you, yes, I wrote that, I mean, you can't have 100% certainty unless you have the lawyer for the, for the charity telling you, yes, that's a genuine document. So that was, uh, it was a sweet moment. The Oregonian had Bob Jones dead to rights, but there was still a huge public interest question to be answered. How did the JWAD program's biggest contractor get away with such an obvious fraud? In an odd arrangement, the 29-employee JWAD agency delegates much of its oversight responsibility to trade groups representing the blind and severely disabled, the largest of which is called NISH. After filing Freedom of Information requests with federal agencies and program offices, Kossif discovered that going back to 1999, both the JWAD committee and NISH officials knew NCED couldn't sufficiently document the number of disabled workers it claimed to employ. We found emails from the committee officials saying, we don't need an, another scandal here, after they were receiving anonymous tips that there might be something wrong. For NISH, enforcing the rules can be tricky. As a trade group, it's made up of member organizations which employ the blind and disabled. But it's also paid commissions for each contract one of those members holds in the JWAD program. 
how can they be asked by anyone, especially the federal government, to then watch over the very people who are giving them money? It just seems, um, it seems just wrong. If weak oversight had allowed Bob Jones to play fast and loose, the Oregonian team wondered what was going on in organizations that were legitimately employing people with severe disabilities. Brian Denson found someone running one in his own backyard. David's got a wood shop that uh, clearly employs people with some severe disabilities. For the most part, he's a guy who's willing to stand up and speak his mind and cry foul where he sees uh, foul being uh, committed. 30 miles south of Portland, nonprofit Mid Valley Rehabilitation is run by David Wiegand. Mid Valley Rehabilitation is a community based rehabilitation organization. We primarily serve people who have developmental disabilities. How do you know when to stop? Severe disabilities like mental retardation, autism, seizure disorders. Same height as that one and very often medical uh, complications as well. You got it? They want to be productive, they want to be members of their community, they want to earn as much money as they can, uh, they want to make as many decisions as they can, and they want to be uh, a part of their community just like anybody else. In the JWAD program, there is no clear definition of what constitutes a severe disability. According to Wiegand, that's an invitation to abuse the program. I'm pulling out a, an ad that was placed uh, some time back, and it, it lists in this ad they're trying to recruit people that have some sort of condition, and things like um, an allergy or hemorrhoids or diabetes or uh, disfiguring condition, uh, a drug problem, a mild learning disability, a personality disorder, a sight impairment, ulcers, varicose veins, you know, even under this, I would qualify because I wear glasses. I just want to watch you make a pallet, all right? Oh, good. <laughs> Mid Valley has not been able to land a JWAD contract as demand has grown for more high skilled work, such as sewing chemical warfare suits or fixing battle-scarred Humvees. These are the people that ought to be in the JWAD program. And David Wiegand, who runs the place, was very happy to tell us that he's been trying to get in that program, but his people are too disabled. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, draw your own conclusions. On March 5th and 6th, 2006, the Oregonian ran its series on the JWAD program. Reporters who had visited contractors in seven states detailed excessive CEO salaries, the use of workers with questionable disabilities, spineless enforcement, and the abuses at El Paso's NCED under Chief Executive Bob Jones. In El Paso, um, the day our story on Bob Jones ran, um, he was forced to resign. Some weeks later, 65 federal agents swept into NCED uh, and collected tons of paper documents and computers. And there have since been lawsuits flying <laughs> throughout El Paso. The Texas Attorney General's office has gotten involved in an investigation. So a lot has happened in El Paso. In the aftermath of the Oregonian series, Bob Jones has become the subject of a criminal fraud investigation by the FBI and the IRS. Jones' one-time charity, NCED, has reorganized under a new name, Ready One Industries, and has cut nearly 3,000 jobs to become compliant with the JWAD rules. Meanwhile, JWAD committee audits have revealed that other large contractors were not using enough blind or severely disabled workers. And the Bush administration has increased JWAD's budget for 2007 to hire additional oversight staff. The series has made many people aware of the JWAD program as well as the problems in it. Most people didn't know what it was. Most people didn't know that we're directing billions of dollars a year to this. And most people didn't know what it could do. And that's really the most important thing because it's not... People aren't just focusing on 
what went wrong at NCED and other nonprofits. They're looking at, okay, we have all these resources. How can we best use them to serve people who are severely disabled? Because that's really the most important part of this, is how, how do we place people in jobs and integrate them into the community? Expose has been provided by